Well, there goes the neighborhood. Good morning, everybody. Wow. Oh, the police are in force enforcing the amusement and humor of this particular program. It's called Dave's Gone By. With me, Dave Lefkowitz, my darling and adorable wife, Joyce, and all the usual fun and enjoyment and beauty of a typical Dave's Gone By episode, albeit compressed. Did you call this Dave's Gone Short? (laughs) Dave's Gone Circumcised, ever so slightly, because for this week, and I will explain why, we're going to have most of the stuff that we usually do but I'll be booking out of here rather than doing a three or three and a half hour show. We're going to keep this one uh, significantly under two hours. I'm sorry. I know this completely ruins your days. I know that, that suddenly you're going to have to find something to do between me and football. But oh, oh, and there's an arm. There's a human sexy arm and glasses and everything. What are you? What? <laughs> that is Joyce right there. Um, so... Here's the deal. It is our 824th episode of the program, and we're calling it Green Day, not to be confused with a band, not to be confused with an episode that we called Green Day about a month and a half ago when uh, Broadway lyricist Amanda Green, who, by the way, is going to be seriously on Broadway in the spring. What about Shecky Green? With that musical. And Shecky Green was on this program mm, couple, many years ago. Yes. We have another green today. So, but this one, though, is the spelling. Why don't you call it Shades of Green? Shades of, yeah, Fifty Shades of Green. Uh, green Belt, no. Turning Green, well, no, we did, I think we did Turning Green or something like that. That's why we're calling this one Green Day, but Green Day with an E. It's a silent E, which is excellent. Can't we call it Greeny? Uh, why, why, why would we call it? Um, it's a pretty name with the Okay. It's not easy being greeny. I mean, you didn't check your Wi-Fi speed. You're super blurry. I'm. I'm a re- well. Yeah, look. I'm not much I can do because I'm. I'm on the. Are you blurry? Uh, maybe I'm gonna. Maybe I blur this and unblur that. Maybe it'll be better oh, now. It's better. Look. Yeah, I probably look. breathed. Look. There we go. Yeah, I probably just moved away from the camera wow. for a moment. See now I'm crystal clear. And everybody's like, now they see my full face and wrinkles, and like, like blur again, more blur. Yeah. Same. Anyway, this is not about the band Blur, nor is it about the band Green Day. It is about our guest, Alexis Green. Uh, Alexis Green is a longtime friend and colleague of yours truly, and she has been a theater critic for bunches of years, theater journalist, and also uh, for the past few decades, an author of books like... Now, this really... I gotta ask her about this, because... um, Here's this book, The Lion King, Pride Rock on Broadway. Notice, notice the author, uh, the, the woman who directed um, The Lion King, most famously and fabulously on Broadway, Julie Taymor. Okay, fine. It's Julie Taymor. Julie Taymor's not on the show today. Okay, fine. Maybe one day we'll get her. That would be nice. But, uh, you know, kind of would be kind of nice that you didn't have to go all the way to this page <laughs> to see, oh, yeah, uh, Julie Taymor with Alexis Green. So, Alexis Green, I don't know how much of this book she wrote. We certainly do know that she's written short biographies of people like uh, Christopher Durang and I believe Wendy Wasserstein Should also. Her, her AlexisGreen.com? Yeah, check and see if that's the correct website. And please, please do. Because this isn't correct. That's her. That's I'm definitely her. Send it. Where she is advertising a book that literally just came out. She's coming on the yeah, I mean she's already in the waiting room, so we're 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 announcing her and stuff. Awesome. So here she is. Well, no, again, this is not Alexis Green herself. This is Emily Mann, her latest biography. Emily Mann, rebel artist of the American theater by, and now she you know she wrote it alone, even though it was based on tons of interviews with Emily Mann. But this is Emily. Uh, this is Alexis Green's new book, put out by the very estimable Applause Theater and Cinema Books, available. It's holiday time for the theater-loving person in your life if you care about Broadway and off-Broadway and also Jewish things. Um, even though, I'll, amazingly enough, Rabbi Sal had wanted to do the interview with Alexis, but she, she was just, eh, I think I'll be more comfortable with you because, you know, there's serious topics and stuff. So uh, maybe leave the rabbi for something else, which worked out perfectly. 
because the rabbi was very busy this weekend. He and I both went to the bat mitzvah of my cousin, Logan. Now, now we, a lot of times we have family on the program because not only is this my way to entertain the world, it's also sort of my archive of, in, in a, a weird way, who's in my family while they're still alive, while they're a certain age. Let's capture these people who are part of my family tree. So sometimes my cousin Adam Glass comes on the show. Um, a week ago, I had my cousin Joshua Pinkow and his wife Dana. They just gave birth literally to a, a little bitty, bitty, as babies will tend to be, a little baby, um, Lucas Foster Pinkow, Mazel Tov. So it, it's just been, it, the year has started so horribly, but there's been a couple of, as the rabbi would say, simchas in the past few weeks. They had a baby, and now it was the bat mitzvah of Josh's sister's daughter. Josh's sister is Stephanie Shefflin. She's married to Adam Shefflin. They've been on the program, I think, on one of our, our New Year's broadcasts. And their kid is, well, I'm going to say she's all grown up, although technically she is now a Jew adult in, in uh, bar, bat mitzvah terms. Uh, was Went to her first bat mitzvah yesterday. Then they're having part two today. And this is, this is the most beautiful thing. And this is absolutely true. This is the world we live in. Okay, so last night they had the ceremony, all the prayers, and she did a ton in Hebrew, which considering that she didn't, it's not like she was studying Hebrew for years and learning Hebrew and the cantillations, all this. She just, you know, she had a bunch of prayers to do and the Haf Torah, which over 12 lessons in half a year, she really, she really did. She really knocked it out. Um, and, and, and bless her for that. God bless her for that. Probably will. But this important ceremony, the religious Jewish part of the bat mitzvah, was done last night, Friday night, traditionally, in the firehouse. Because um, Stephanie's husband, Adam, is a volunteer firefighter. It's been for, for many years. So, you know, they do it. He's got connections. Know, that, He's an, oh, he's an EMT? I thought he was an EMT. Then he's an EMT at the fire. So why, why the fire department? Why because the fire I think house? he's an EMT for the fire department. Then he's an EMT for the fire department. I'm so, not, what do I know? But that's where they do the religious part of, it, part of the ceremony. Um, fine. Great. It was very nice. A big old room. And then the collation was like a party itself. Uh, after services, you know, they served coffee. and There was Italian food. And there was cookies and oh my god I, I wanted to leave a lot because i never like these things and as much as i you know am proud to be part of the family as a certain person i don't to talk to them i don't want to be there i don't want to see anybody i hate parties I'm, it's also still a pandemic so half the time when i'm not eating i've got the mask on and they got music playing low just they put the radio on but oh my god i'm so glad that joyce and i chose never to have children. Not because you couldn't feel a sense of great pride when Logan was up there doing her spiel, doing the Haftorah, um, you know, really looking great and laying like in a, whatever that word means in, in, this, in 2021. But the children, children, it's nobody disciplines children anymore. I think every parent is now afraid to look like they're from the 1950s and like you know, from Big Mouth, Adam Glauberman's father, of <laughs> just being rage filled. Because if I were a parent, and I saw, and literally during the ceremony, during the speeches, during, you know, because they, they put together this whole lovely, the rabbi did this, the whole lovely booklet of all the prayers and what family member came up when to say which speech or which prayer or sing which song. Really, really nicely, very nicely done. Through it all, you got like eight to 12 year olds just running around, yelling, jumping on each other, piling on each other, banging on the walls through the whole thing. I'm like, if I were a parent, I'm so glad I am not a parent because I don't care who'd be watching me. I would just pick the child up by the scruff of the, well, I guess this is the scruff of the neck, but the scruff near the neck and just haul off and smack them into next week. I know this is not a politically correct thing to say. Yeah, but everybody, everybody has different. I think we're at a disadvantage because we're only children. 
Mm. So only children self-regulate, like we read, we think, like we're different. And I think my my parental style was completely like do what you want. I could have done whatever I wanted and because I was the only child, my grandmother, they're like, You're the princess, I could have done anything. Yeah. So I had I mean, but I also grew up uh, you grew up to religious school, I went to religious school. It was the law. So what my parents did was let the, the school <laughs> create the... So I think, like, it's very... Why be an authoritative parent? I think, you know, parental styles are different. People do what well, they want. That's why, that's why. I mean, if, if you're a little unruly... I mean, these are children. These are 8, 9, 10-year-olds. But literally, while this soul service this is, is going on... This is, this is how people are. This is what people are. But, I mean, you know, I was an unruly kid. I was... I was Undisciplined, I was noisy, and like those children, I had boundless energy. Yeah. I didn't even know where it came. When you are that age, yeah. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it's seven o'clock at night, eight o'clock, and you're still running around. You're crazy. You're screaming. You're hopped up on whatever um, the food you're eating, oh, and there's candies right. on the they table. Probably, they probably have candy, so yeah. Um... But still, I I knew enough at occasions like this not to just be yeah. running around yelling. I might be running around a little bit, but not yelling. Well, maybe they have a lot of uh, things to say. God, I hate <laughs> children. I just hate children. It's amazing. Wow. Or, or I'm confirmed in my hatred of them. I don't think. I don't think it's. I think you just hate chaos. You yeah. Want, you <clears> want to, I don't think it has anything to do with the kids. I don't think it has anything to do necessarily with the screaming. I think you are somebody who was. Um, we both like rules, but I think you like. It bothers you when people don't follow the rules, right? So, like, yes. when people don't use the turn signal, you go crazy. <laughs> sure. You know, when somebody's in a line and they have ten items and it's for eight yes! items. Yes. So you're. It's more about like you're like, and also I think like you're a performer, so you want them to give attention to the. I think it's actually this. That too. Because you feel like they're performing, you know, doing performance, the the bar, the bat mitzvah and the rabbi. And then you want everyone, as you you want to complete focus, control, right. you want them to focus on the action. And that's, that's right. just, it's you. Because the running around and screaming didn't bother me so much no. when it was over and when people no. were just eating. Yeah. I think, David, it has nothing to do with, like, hating kids. I think it, for you it's about rules and it's about the performer gets the show. And I think that's how people are. Like, this is how... You know, only children were just different. We're just completely self-contained. Everyone yeah. thinks we're extroverts, whatever. But no, we're no. just, we're happy with the book. I'll leave me alone to do my writing, to do my... I want to be like Leonard Cohen. I want to go yeah. up to a monastery. Yeah. But, for, he, but a monastery that has a theater. So on Saturday nights, when everybody can talk for a few hours. You know, after, after the days of silence, you get up there, you can do a show. Yeah, but you know the joke Leonard Cohen wrote and said he was never more miserable than at the Buddhist monastery. Oh. He did this whole piece about it. He couldn't find peace at a monastery. <laughs> this is, so yeah, because you monastery, you don't, you, know, you, you don't get Rebecca de Mornay to, to ease your, your uh, whatever is in a monastery. Oh, uh, or or Marianne. Marianne yeah. yeah. No, no. Yeah. You know, when you're like Cohen, you don't want to be in a monastery because, <laughs> as, as uh, let's just say, he wrote a song called Don't Go Home With Your Heart On. This is a man who's not going to be living along, among men. No, for, he said he just couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't quiet himself. But I think for you, I think it's nothing to do with it. It's just, you like, like, this is you, you like order. It's like, to use your turn signal. If someone, if someone's performing, you have to focus. If that's you, it's just order. You like order. I do, you I do. Like and order. let me give you the order if of the show. you have those two <clears throat> items and you have ten, give them to the person behind you. Yes. Or do two orders. Go on, 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 on. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Or apologize profusely yes, to yes. everyone. I'm so sorry. Yes. It's ten. I thought I'd have eight. I got Here's it for ten. My, my sainted, my sainted uh, uh, grandmother, grandfather who needed this, you mm. know, needed these Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but since I like rules and order, it's not Robert's role, rules of order, it's Dave's. The order of this program, Dave's Gone By, this episode of Dave's Gone By, oh, we're going to start with an interview with, as we said, Alexis Green, the author of this brand new book. Plus, after that, we will do some grilly crimes and old times. We will have a My Sick Mind segment where I've made up some jokes about the Travis Scott concert. Yes, it's a Travis D. And we'll have, speaking of horrible things, Colorado Limerick of the Damned, where we go to uh, Sterling, Colorado. And then Rabbi Sol Solomon, he was up all night um, editing this down. He was at the Bat Mitzvah with me. Whoa. 
last night at the fire. Oh, that was the, the thing I was going to say. They had all this stuff at the firehouse, and then today we're going to the temple. We're going to a synagogue in Oceanside. And that's where the party is. So the ceremony was at a firehouse. The party is at the temple. And, you know, if you think the pandemic has, has mixed the world up, I don't know. Anyway, but Rabbi Sal brought a tape recorder to the bat mitzvah. And we're not going to make you sit through the service or any of that. But he spoke to a lot of the people who were there, kind of tumbled with them, as Catskill rabbis would. We're going to play that at the end of the show, just for all of you. But before that begins, let us admit our guest into the neighborhood. She is the author of several books. She's just logging in as we speak. Yeah, Alexis Green joining us in the neighborhood. Let me get uh, my questions ready. I'll remind you that Alexis used to write for Theater Week, for which I used to write as well. Um, she's written the book Lucille Lortel, Queen of Off-Broadway, and <clears throat> short biographies of people like Christopher Durang, and, uh, oh, and I, I should call you Dr. Green because you actually have a doctorate from uh, City University of New York in theater, yay. She has taught drama criticism at NYU and Marymount Manhattan College. I didn't even know NYU had drama criticism classes. She should have taken them. But Alexis Green, I'm going to ask you to unmute your microphone and then say hello to all of us, and then we will chat. Mm. So just um, do the unmute thing. I know you're looking for it. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can ask her to unmute. I, I just did, yeah. <clears throat> I'm now unmuted. You yes, are, you are indeed. Welcome, welcome to you, Alexis. How are you? I am fine, David, and it's wonderful to be here this morning. Good morning. Good morning to you too. Now, where where you live in this this beautiful area, right? You're not in Manhattan right now. You're where are you? Or you go up to upstate, or or you have a, a... Uh, no? I, I'm in Manhattan on the Upper West Side. Oh my gosh! So, how has the pandemic been for you in terms of just life and also being a, a published writer? Well, actually, um, in twenty in twenty twenty, you know, when it all began, um, it allowed me to, uh, you know, concentrate and write, and uh, and finish uh, the book uh, Emily Mann, Rebel Artist of the American Theater, and so um, I didn't mind the isolation because I had a project. You know, did you, that, that did you finish the, the book quicker than some of your other books because you weren't going to the theater, you weren't going to concerts, you weren't traveling, you know, you could just work or basically same amount of time? Well, I got to tell you, I started writing this biography in 2014. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> All right. Does it normally um, take that long to do a bio? Because that's why I've never wanted to tackle one of these things. It just seems like this, the Sisyphusian rock to push well it, it it is quite a project i mean um there are people who have written you know 10 biographies i don't quite know how they do it uh but i started in 2014 and yeah it takes a takes a lot because you travel you go to libraries you go to interview people i went uh, across the country to interview some people and uh it now, was this your idea initially, or did someone say, hey, somebody should write a bi biography of Emily Mann. It ought to be Alexis Green because she writes about women playwrights and blah, 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 blah. I mean, it, uh, that is a wonderful question. Uh, it was it was my idea. I'd written a biography of Lucille Lortel. Oh, thank you for okay, it. Yeah, it just, okay. <laughs> uh, I'd written a biography of Lucille Lortel back in the early 2000s, and I wanted to write another biography because it is really a wonderful form and also there are not many biographies of contemporary american women in the theater there just are not and so around 2014 and i backtracking a little bit here i've known emily mann a long time since at least 1983 and interviewed her for articles and we've been on panels together and so I sent her a LinkedIn message <laughs> in 2014, like, hey, wh what would you think of this, of my writing a biography of you? And she 
you know, sent a message back, that would be great. And there we were. Yeah. So let me ask you, at that point, you had the idea you wanted to write the book. Did you have applause on board at that point? Or did you have to send them a, an outline of Precy? Or, or how did you get it? It's one thing to say, I'm going to write a book. It's another to say, uh, it's going to be published and in bookstores by the time of the holidays. Okay. So uh, this is a long story. I started out with the university press, actually. Okay. And uh, that did not work out for a number of reasons. University presses, some of them are quite wonderful, but also they ask for subventions and they don't give much of any of, a, of an advance. You're, in other words, they, they want you to put in money to help them publish your book. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, there are academic presses uh, that we have a scientist friend who publishes all the time. And it's amazing that legitimate, serious academic journals, especially for the, the hard sciences, is like, oh, yeah, you know, not only is it vetted, not only do you have to have it, you know, with editors and people looking it over and stuff, but you're paying like thousands of dollars to get it. It's self-publishing and you get all the pain in the ass of having, you know, being a real publishing thing. It's, it's right. like, whoa, did you have that with your, your press whom you're very carefully not naming? Well, they you wanted me to um, cut a lot of words. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, my editor, uh, my editor, Philip Turner, who was uh, a wonderful editor and also became my agent. He's a great agent. And uh, we just talked with each other and said, look, we can do better than this. And so he found applause for me. Right. And um, which, uh, you know, has been great. Did and you have to make it a less academic -y? But I mean, did you have one idea? Well, it's academic press and it's going to be footnotes and this and this. And now can like, it can be more for a general audience. Or was it really the same book? You know, I, I don't write academic ease to begin really? with. Yeah. Uh, uh, I just I just don't believe in it. And um, if I may say so, and people who have responded to the book who have already read it have said it's a, a wonderful read, if I may say so. You may and, say so, yeah. Um, and, um, so there was very little editing on that score from, from applause. You know? So let me ask what, um, give, first of all, give us the outline. That's we haven't really, I've kind of backed into this for people who don't know about the book, for people who don't know who the heck Emily Mann is, just give us the basic pricey and make us want to read this. Who is Emily <laughs> Mann? What has she done? You know, why her? Why Emily Mann? Well, she's an extraordinary playwright, I think, and a fine director. And for three decades, from 1990 to 2020, she led the McCarter Theatre Center in Princeton, New Jersey. She was the first woman to be hired to lead that theater, which had existed since the, 19, the late 1920s, at least. And um, there have been many firsts for Emily Mann uh, as, as a woman in the theater. She was the first woman to direct uh, on the main stage of the Guthrie Theater in 1979. So she's been a model for women in the theater. And on a human level, on a, on a personal level, she's had um, many challenges to face. She's had multiple sclerosis, which she has dealt with for, for a long time. Uh, but as she says, and I quote her toward the end of the book, that's not, that's really just one more thread in the weave now. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. been in remission for, for, for decades. She was sexually assaulted. So there, there are many aspects to Emily Mann. She is an extraordinary artist of the theater, I believe. And uh, she is also a woman whose life I hoped I portrayed in uh, a way that will uh, attract, uh, you know, readers 
to uh, her life and to what her goes, work. you know, to what women have to deal with, not only in the arts but uh, in general American culture. We should say we should say that one of her plays, <coughs> excuse me, is the Broadway hit uh, "Having Our Say." Yes, about uh, the Delaney sisters, the two uh, African American sisters, and some of her other works that people might know are. I think uh, Execution of Justice, uh, people might know, uh, possibly on the West Coast in San Francisco, because it's uh, based on the trial of the gentleman who uh, murdered Harvey Milk and uh, Mayor Moscone of San Francisco. And actually, at the moment, there is an off-off-Broadway company here in New York City called Playhouse Creatures Theater Company that is devoting its entire 2021-2022 season to a retrospective of Emily's plays. And um, at the moment, uh, they're screening a virtual presentation of Execution of Justice. Now, and, I'm, I'm, I also want to ask a question in terms of your kind of friends, I would say, with Emily Mann, right, at this point, certainly, and, uh, you know, respectful, biographical, sure friend do the when you say okay i'm writing this book does she get to read the entire thing before it's published does she have any say of being able to say you know take this out or or are you like you know love you thanks it won't be a book without you emily but my book um she did not she i sir i did give her a manuscript to read before it went to be published but she did, did not have final approval. Right. Okay. Because I can't tell you how many, no, no it's, it's still a finite number. But when I do interviews and you get in with someone, you start talking to them. And then after the interview's over, especially if it's pre recorded, you get a call, usually from the manager or the agent, is, you know, that bit you were talking about, she really she shouldn't have brought that up. She shouldn't have brought that up. Can you just, and then I'm, I'm in the position of either being the asshole who leaves it in. Or, you know, the, the censorious person who takes it out and was probably the best part of the, the talk, you know, so, yeah. It's not a hagiography. Cool. Am I pronouncing the word correctly? Hagiography? Hey, hey, I'm, I'm not sure, but I know what, what you're saying. And so so what, what's a bit of dish that, you know, that's negative about her in a bi the only bio of her? Oh, oh, uh, I wouldn't say that there is anything necessarily negative about her uh you know there were there you know people are, are are people and uh sometimes they behave better at certain times than at other times and oh. uh so you know some of those times are in there what does she see as her greatest achievement what does she say is her yes. greatest achievement? was what does emily mann say is her own because it may not jive with your idea or with the world's idea. Oh, well, she had a show on Broadway. Boom. Well, she ran the McCarter for, you know, that's, you know, a... that's an interesting question. And she uh, has never expressed uh, that to me. Maybe she's ex expressed what she thinks her greatest achievement is to um, others. At one point in the book, she does, I do quote her saying to me that what she may be most remembered for is her plays because that tells, yeah. to some extent that's the nature of theater you know now have um, you ever written did you ever try to write a play alexis yeah when i was about 10 years old do you, do you remember <laughs> what it was about and what what it was and uh i don't actually <laughs> but uh uh, you know, uh, I'd have to go back and, and think about that and get back to you. <laughs> well, but you, you entered theater, at least the realm, professionally in a journalism capacity, a critic, a writer, an interviewer. Uh, no, I had, so I, I, whatever that play was back when I was 10 years old, I don't think it was, it, you know, I, I think we put it on in school. I went to the Dalton School at the time. And whatever happened it was not the biggest shit in the world and i decided to be an actor instead did you, <laughs> I oh, so, as an actor um did you go to um university for, i know you have a doctorate in theater for it but were you your your doctorate at that point wasn't for performance was it no oh no 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 no, no. and you know i went for my doctorate when i was in my 30s so 
so did you where did you go for undergrad work and what did uh, you do Vassar College. That? Yeah. Where? Vassar College. Vassar, oh, Dalton Vassar. Woo. Alexis yeah. Green, my Dr. Green in so so do you feel on some level not in terms of like white privilege or anything, but you feel that you had a privileged upbringing in terms of being able to go to these Tony kinds of schools or are they overrated? When you ask if it's a privileged upbringing, uh, are you using privileged in a positive or a negative sense? Both, either one. Well, I mean, well, positive in the sense of, you know, it gave you a leg up and, and like, my wife has uh, you know, went to Columbia University, and that gives her a bit more street cred than she has from even the place that she got her doctorate, right? Because, oh, I believe Columbia, you know, you say the word, it's like someone goes to Harvard or Yale, there's a, a thing attached. So when you say Dalton, or you say Vassar, and I mean, it's, it's Wendy Wasserstein land, is it? Uh, w Wasserstein, she went to Wellesley, I believe, Mount Holyoke, oh, I forget which. Um, you know, it, they were, they were good schools. Uh, I had a fine education at, at Dalton, uh, and, uh, a good education at Vassar. I think Vassar is probably now a stronger school than when I went there. It's co-ed. Uh, there are more people of color there. It was a fairly white school, you know, when I was going. Uh, I was wondering where, where you were going with that, uh, with questioning the word privilege. Now I understand, because you were thinking, oh, is he saying about this kind of, I got, yeah, okay. Um, so, because you, one of the things that you um, point out for Emily Mann was that she had to get out of the whole white enclave thing. And when she got to Chicago, um, you know, from, from uh, was Massachusetts, she, the, the family went to Chicago, she suddenly felt she could breathe. One of the reasons being she was going to college with, you know, 20% black and, and, and people from other places rather than like 5% or 2% or tokens, as it were. Do you, did you, was that an awakening for you when you came out of this sort of enclave thing and went into the world of New York and New York theater? Um, I've always thought of theater as a very supportive family. That was one of the things I love, loved about it and, and still do love about it. And it was not as diverse then when I was trying to be an actor as it certainly is now, but it did open a world of very, very different people right. than those I had grown up with or gone to school with. There's no question about that. What was your career trajectory at that point? So you got out of college and it's not like you suddenly got- I came to New York yeah. and I, um you know went to auditions i read backstage i you know did you were you in any off or off off broadway shows yeah like um i was in an off broadway a couple of off off broadway productions and an off broadway off broadway production at the roundabout when it was still when the roundabout was still in the basement of the supermarket over in, in the 17th West. street was it or yeah. i was the artistic director what, what show was it uh his wife had written or or he and his wife had written uh an adaptation of oedipus rex set to, set in the caribbean how was and it? it and and gordon heath uh who was uh an african-american actor who had been on broadway had ended up living in France because uh, perhaps he could not get as much work here uh, as he wanted. Uh, he was Oedipus. Oh my, and you were Joe. Oh, whoa, so that's a pretty good gig, but it didn't, You at some point you had to figure, you know, I, I need to, to have an income, I need to have a different life than this. Oh, yeah, I, um, 
people would say to me, well, I, I mean, I, I just couldn't get cast enough, right. you know, and- uh, As 97% of actors cannot, yes, okay. Right. And so I, um, and people, uh, people would say to me that uh, I was kind of a character ingenue or a character actress, and I just had to, you know, sort of grow into my face, grow older and grow into my face. And I went, I'm sorry, I can't wait that long. So uh, well, was that a big I went back to school. For, for to get into the academics. Well, uh, oh, I started writing uh, in local newspapers and then I went back to school to get a master's in, in theater and ultimately a PhD. Now, what were the focuses of that? Because theater is a very broad term. So there, are you, it was it in dramatic literature, criticism, in set building? What, what were your, you know, your concentrations? Uh, my dissertation was on uh, off off Broadway theater during the 60s in New York. Whoa. City. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That, that's a pretty great, and that's probably, I mean, you can go read that still if you go to like the Library of Congress. Oh, people, believe it or not, people still, you know, you can download dissertations these days uh, from the internet and people still download that dissertation. And they cite it, I'm sure, in their... their... I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to also, I held up this book before. You also worked, well, you, can you see it? Uh, it's, it's the, I, yes, I see yeah. it. And this pissed me off, I have to say, a little bit. I don't know if, I, I wonder if you had whatever about future printings or something. Because, oh, The Lion King. Ooh, Pride Rock on Broadway. Look who wrote it. Oh, uh, Julie Taymor. That's wait, Julie Taymor. Wow, she's a busy person. It's amazing she took all this time to write a book. Let me just find out a little bit more. Oh yeah. Oh oh yeah. Look at this. Uh, yeah yeah. Julie Taymor. Oh, when it looks like a dream. Did did that when you saw the cover of this? Were you like, you know, I'm not a ghostwriter. I kind of belong on the damn cover. Yeah, I I had a a lawyer friend uh, talk with them um, to to get my name on the book. Yeah. So, uh, you know, um, but that that's water under the bridge. Well, let me ask you, though, um, in, the, in a book like that, where it is a collaboration, because this one, obviously, you couldn't have done this book without chatting with Emily Mann for, you know, hours and hours on tape and stuff, and then people she knew and doing all the research. With this book, sure, you're, it's also a collaboration. How much was you and how much was Tamor? You know, it's um, a, a lot of it was me, but, of course, they, they let me sit in on rehearsals. Um, I do remember, you know, interviewing Julie, uh, at her home quite a bit. But it sounds like I, the actual writing That's a hard, a hard question you. to answer uh, from this distance. No, but, but it really sounds like you essentially wrote the book and put it together, but Julie Tanmore sells the, are you, we're nodding, but you can't, you, legally, you, you can't say, I wrote the demo, uh, as opposed to like the Lucille Lortel book, which again is you, you know, that's your book. You did the work, you you interviewed. Oh, completely, is, yes, yeah. yes. Now, she was alive when you were doing that book, so you No, oh, no, oh, oh. She, she had passed, she oh. had already passed. So again, was that a self For a long time, it, she, hmm. the estate asked me to, to write that book. It was an authorized biography. Uh, Lucille had always wanted uh, a book about herself. And they, they, the estate felt probably correctly that it was best to wait because she would have wanted it a particular way and this way. You know, you could tell the truth, but you know, you tell the whole truth. I mean, um, well, I mean, she kind of an interesting life. What is like the most weird thing or the funniest thing in researching and writing that book? That you, got Lucy Lord, what? That made you go, oh my goodness, a great story. Oh, uh, wow. Um, that really takes me back. I think uh, I, I remember learning or researching about her early life and her wanting to be a, a film actress and not being able to, to make that happen. And 97%, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she was quite stunning looking when she, when she was younger, Lucille. 
but but it didn't work out right. and uh, she married a, a very rich man instead I think there were worse things <laughs> and he allowed her to that be is the true. that is true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all friend. Now you uh, also sorry. And I'm not giving her enough credit because and, and of course she started the White Barn Theater. Right. Yeah. 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 I, know. I mean, you know, you can marry for money and then just leave a the a very pleasant, rich life, or you can marry for money and then start foundations and things and then and, and start theaters. I mean, for sure. Let me ask you also, you've written um this is kind of a great idea for uh, of like I want to read a biography that's longer than a wiki page or a wiki thing or just, but I also don't want to read like a 400 page thing. You've done a couple of those about some other playwrights, like it was like a hundred pages or less they're called or, or, um, of, of Durang and. Well, uh, essentially I think they, the work they're amounted to writing, you know, um, introductions to, Oh. oh, yeah, to those to those books. Oh, so those books were what were they mostly excerpts of their plays? I, I haven't seen. Yes, them. Oh, that's I like right. what, they were short biographies. Yeah, that were um, yeah. yeah, but you wrote yeah. intros for for those. Yeah. So can I ask you also? Um, you've this this totally came out of the blue, but it's on your website. I mean, so you write about theater, and you you write you both. You know, for the major marketing about theater, you've written academically about theater and all of this and biographies. Oh, and true crime. Where, where did that come from? Oh, where did that come from? What a what a, a fascinating question. My husband and I have a cabin uh, in upstate New York in a section of the Catskills called the Southern Tier of the Catskills. And the Catskills, as you may imagine, uh, has been very fertile territory for murders and uh, uh, other crimes. Well, I know a lot of uh, comics up there who just killed, but no, that's not <laughs> <laughs> And I discovered a story about a woman named Bessie Wheeler who may or may not have committed suicide. Perhaps she was shot in 1910. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a domestic and she became pregnant probably by uh, a young man in the household where she cleaned and, you know, did the laundry and took care of things. And so the question is the, the case of Bessie Wheeler, suicide or murder. And uh, again, it involved research, which I love to do, and uh, talking with people uh, in upstate New York. I also love to interview people. And so. Well, how did you, I mean, this happened in 1910. It's not yeah. like you could have had witnesses. Uh, or, or, I mean, you must well, there were witnesses, but, but but there was an inquest, and there are, you know, transcripts of an inquest, and there are, you know, local newspaper uh, reporters who who uh, who covered it. Wow! Wow! And uh, I also visited the house where uh, this took place. And uh, the man who owns the house now uh, welcomed, you know, he didn't know about this history. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, now they have to disclose when something like that happens. You can't sell a house if some horrible event happened there. You, the the real estate well, has to say so. Um, this was a long time ago. Yeah. And, and, uh, what is the name of that book, by the way? What is, what is the name of the true crime book? Is it Bessie Wheeler or what? Or, or... Uh, the story is called uh, The Case of Bessie Wheeler suicide or murder and uh it, it of itself is not long enough for a, a book so i'm trying to write a, a couple of more stories to go with it <laughs> is that your next major project or are you mulling another biography or what uh i i think that's my next major project yes we, we have an inside <laughs> scoop here on Dave's Gone By. We're talking with Alexis Green. We have just a couple more minutes with you, but I do have a couple more questions for you. You have seen the sea change, <clears throat> not just in arts journalism, but in, in journalism in particular. And you've been a theater critic. You used to write for, for Theater Week a lot. Um, 
What do you feel about the quote unquote democratization of theater criticism from like these ivory tower people at the major dailies and the occasional John Simony Weekly to like go on the internet and read everybody's review of Jagged Little Pill? That's a hard question to answer. I think, unfortunately, what has happened with the reduction of print newspaper of newspapers, for instance, and and magazines, that you know there are fewer calls for the the sort of theater review that I used to write uh, that appears in the New York Times or for instance that Chris Jones writes for the Chicago Tribune and 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 the New York Daily News you know theater criticism used to be an art form in its way uh, you know, it, it's not easy to write a an good, an interesting, readable, perceptive yeah. theater review, and it's also, you know, a, as a, as a biographer, as as anybody who who's a, some sort of historian, to go back to theater reviews is very very valuable because the best theater reviews actually describe uh, what. Uh, you know, took place on the stage, uh, you know, the, the setting, the lighting, the music, the acting. And so while I think um, in one sense, it, it's great that, that people can get online and, uh, you know, and give out their, their views of a show that they've seen. And I'm sure that, um, the, the more that that happens, perhaps the more it draws people to go see that show. Hmm. I, I do think what we've lost in terms of losing uh, professional theater criticism is unfortunate. Okay, and that's, I mean, it's a pretty reasonable thing. I don't know where it's going to wind up, how the circle will eventually turn. Um, have you written theater? I mean, do you still go to the theater uh, in New York? as a professional do you just go sometimes when there's a show you want to see how how connected are you to broadway now that it's coming back i've been going more to off off and uh off broadway uh productions as opposed to uh broadway but uh that's basically a, i mean of course the pandemic you know that Right. Well, have you seen anything post pandemic? Have you seen anything since March 2020 on off 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 Broadway in in upstate New York, Connecticut, you know, Jersey? Uh, upstate New York, uh, I uh, subscribe to the Glimmer Glass Opera. Ooh, okay. <clears throat> uh, which is in Cooperstown. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they performed uh, outdoors. They erected a, an outdoor stage this past summer. And uh, so I saw everything there. And I've seen a, a couple of off-Broadway uh, presentations and productions since uh, coming back to the well, What was your favorite? Well, when you went off off-Broadway, did you have a, a one that you really liked? The one that was made an impression on you? Uh, well, these were very short-lived, yeah. Um, oh, I saw something oh, called Statue Fest, which is uh, a series of short uh, mon monologues about women who should be on pedestals. Hmm, okay. Who, uh, uh, are not, you know, written about very much. And uh, well, I could see that would attract you as a, a theme. Was it good? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. And... Uh, it, it, it was very nice. It was at a small, uh, in a small house uh, off off Broadway, and everybody was wearing a mask, which was a little strange. Hmm. But uh, it was it was good to be with a, a group of people again. You know. Right. Uh, now let me ask you. I want to remind people one more time. 
uh, that we're talking with Alexis Green, the author of several books about the theater, including Lucy Lortel book and, and um, the Lion King, you know, the name should be right here, <laughs> with, with the Julie Taymor book, and of course this brand new one, just in time for Thanksgiving, just in time for the holiday giving season, ladies and gentlemen, and it, since it's from Applause Theater and Cinema Books, you can get it in all the places that you get books from the Drama Bookshop right on to Amazon. And also, there, there's more about it, more about Alexis Green at your own website, which is alexisgreen.com, and it's, there's the E on the end of it, G-R-E-E-N-E. -E -E. So it's alexisgreen.com. Com. So if you want to find out more about Alexis and also getting her new book and, and, and some of her old books, please do go there. Alexis, last question for you. Do you have a favorite play or production of all time? Favorite play or production of all time? What a wonderful question. What, this really dates me. Um, one of the first productions I ever saw was a revival of Peter Pan, believe it or not. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> With Mary Martin. And uh, I think it was at the city center. I'm not sure about that. And I loved it. Cyril Richard, especially. He, oh he was just amazing. Well, he's I no, no Christopher him. Walken, but he'll, he'll do. He'll do his book. <laughs> And I'll bet that stayed with you. It was, I mean, Peter Pan is a pretty magical piece of work. And it's, it's um, you know. Did you ever see Mabel Mines, Peter and Wendy? That was magnificent, if you ever. I don't think I never saw that, no. Oh, it was, that was something. Because it takes Peter Pan, keeps it in context, but then pulls it into a whole different, it's, it was a masterpiece. And unfortunately, I don't think we'll ever see that again. Maybe it's at the library. Since you're a research person, I'll bet they've recorded it at the, <laughs> the Performing Arts. Well, Alexis, you look great, you sound great, and you're obviously writing great. Everybody get a copy of Emily. I just did a, a Joe Franklin move right there. Everybody get a copy of Rebel Artist of the American Theater, Emily Mann from Alexis Green. Stay well, stay writing, stay thinking, um, stay criminal if you're going to be dwelling on that true crime <laughs> stuff. Alexis, thank you so much. Thank joining. you, David. This has been great. Okay. Have a great I'm going to let you go. And thank you for being in the neighborhood. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Alexis Green, everybody. Oh, so happy and, and quite honored to have Alexis as a friend and colleague and now a friend of the neighborhood. That's a great way for me to segue into letting you know who and what the friends of the neighborhood are. It simply means that people who've been on this program in months or years past, uh, we consider them like friends. We consider them family, and we like to keep tabs on them, let you know what they're up to. So we'll let you know if writes another book, right? And we'll let you know if um, uh, she ends up putting those true crime things together into, and I'm sorry, I'm just trying to, to, to get my iTunes going here, sorry, to get the music up for Friends of the Neighborhood. There we go. So here we go. Let's, let's let you know. Um, I'll say, first of all, that Rabbi Saul Solomon is coming up later in this program uh, with a recording that he made last night talking to people at my cousin's bat mitzvah. You don't want to miss that. You're going to love it. But Rabbi Saul has been on this program from our very first episode back in October of 2002. If you want to find out more about him, go to his website, shalomdammit.com. And we're very excited next week. We're going to debut the promo trailer for Shalom Dammit, an evening with Rabbi Saul Solomon. That is the one-person, uh, two-man show, because there's a piano accompanist, that he did all the way back almost a decade ago, off-off Broadway. He brought it back a year or two later. They've been working on it. We've done it in Colorado. Well, Rabbi Saul, now that the pandemic is sort of easing in several states, he wants to bring the show back, bring it back to New York, bring it to various states around the country and even countries. So one of the things that we've had to do 
was really put together a professional looking trailer for the show. I think it looks wonderful. I think it looks hilarious. And and i um, going to give a big shout out to, he's not a friend of the neighborhood because he hasn't been on the show, but a big shout out to Jeff Thatcher for putting together that video that you will see next week making its debut. And then we're going to put it everywhere <laughs> where producers can see it to show them, okay, this is the, the play. This is the musical with Rabbi Saul Solomon. It's funny. It's great. It's in front of audiences. It works. Put this thing on. We'll see. Anywho, that's next week. But Rabbi Saul, you can see a lot of the other things he's done at his website, shalomdammit.com. I want to give a, um, a shout out of congratulations to our fairly recent friend of the neighborhood, Andrew Farris. Now, Farris is a singer-songwriter. He came to the fore with songs that he wrote and, and played on with the humongous 1980s and 90s band In Excess. He's now doing more country pop music. He was on the program a, a few weeks ago talking about his new album. Check this out. Andrew Farris, one of the songs that he did with In Excess is called Break My Heart. Oh, no, excuse me. Now, the In Excess song was called Need You Tonight. It was a huge, huge hit for them. Well, an even bigger hit, Break My Heart, uses part of the melody or, or, or maybe samples Break My Heart. This is, I don't know why, but I'm just, I'm still woozy from the bar mitzvah last night. Here we go. Okay. In Excess song, Need You Tonight. Right? Right. Big hit. Now there's this new artist named Dua Lipa, apparently huge, I don't follow new music, but Dua Lipa has a humongous hit called Break My Heart. It's so big that this song has reached one billion streams on the internet. And uh, Andrew Farris kind of gets, I guess he gets a little cut of that, but also some credit of that because he's on that old In Excess song that Break My Heart quotes from. So congratulations. Woo! That was a long way around that to Andrew Farris. Also, want to let you know that Trav SD, get it? Trav SD, Trav SD, um, tonight is doing the Pilgrim's Progress as part of the Gotham Storytelling Festival that is at the Crane Theater over on East 4th Street, speaking of off-off-Broadway. Uh, Linda Edder is playing tonight at Feinstein's 54 Below, so go see her. She was in the original uh, Jekyll and Hyde, the Frank Wildhorn musical. She's got quite a voice. Go hear her at Feinstein's 54 Below. And speaking of a voice and legs, well, dancing legs, Donna McKechnie, who is in a chorus line, friend of the neighborhood, playing tonight at the Green Room 42. Donna McKechnie, Broadway legend. Um, and musical legend Tony Orlando. He is, if you don't want to go into New York City, at the Suffolk Theater. I believe that's in Patchog. I believe it is. The Suffolk Theater, Tony Orlando. Go see him tonight. If it dawns on you. <laughs> a little, little dawn joke there. Okay. Uh, what else is happening this week? On Monday, Tova Felchu will be in conversation live at the Lortel. Just talking about Lucille Lortel. So go to live at the Lortel.com on Monday night to see the wonderful, excuse me, the wonderful Tova Felchu. On Tuesday, Karen Grasley of Little House on the Prairie fame. Her memoir comes out. It's called Bright Lights, Prairie Dust. It's from She Writes Press, and you can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the usual places. Bright Lights, Prairie Dust. And the only thing that ticks me off about this is I'll bet she'll tell all these stories and real-life things about her life and life on Little House on the Prairie that when she was on our program like 15 years ago, maybe in go <laughs> could, could, with all these things and suddenly you have to read the bio 15 years later oh that happened oh michael landon was like all right fine i gotta go back and listen to the interview anywho who else who else uh karen mason is having her birthday bash on tuesday night that is at feinstein's 54 below we're trying to get her back on the program in late november or december because she's going to be doing some gigs in New York in a couple of weeks. We'll see. Fingers crossed. Um, Mrs. Warren's Profession, that is being done by the Gingle Theater Group, and it's playing now through November 20th, featuring our friends Karen Ziemba, love her, and Robert Cuccioli, both of them. Well, I love him too. I mean, they're both 
we have great guests on the show. Mrs. Warren's profession that George Bernard Shaw play at uh, Gingold Theatre Group. King Ludwig's play. He was just on two or three weeks ago. It's a new play called Dear Jack, Dear Louise, all about his family. And it's at the George Street Playhouse in New Jersey, playing now through mid-November. Also playing now through mid-November, the comedy Fairy Cakes at the Greenwich House Theatre Off-Broadway with Julie Halston in it. If you're making later plans for that, uh, it was going to be running through January. The reviews were mez a mez, so, so they're closing it a bit earlier than they had wanted it to, but you still have two more weeks to catch. Is it two more weeks? Well, a week and a half. To catch Dear Jack, Dear Louise at the George... Oh, I'm sorry, to catch Fairy Cakes at the Greenwich House Theater. Hon, you walked in for the, this, this incredibly important moment. I'm can you make some noise? I, I cannot. I'm doing a webinar in German. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I'm on a German webinar. Oh, wait, use your foot. Step on, step on the thing again there. <laughs> Guess what? We have an alert. Oh, no. It's an Austin Pendleton alert. Oh. <laughs> Austin Pendleton, a friend of the neighborhood, and Mar also, speaking of a marvelous interview on the show, um, the, the funny thing about him is when we mention him on Friends of the Neighborhood, at a certain point, especially a couple of years ago, like every week he would not only be in something, but it was something different from the week before. So he'd be on Broadway, and then Austin, so go see Austin Pendleton in this at Lincoln Center Theater. And then two weeks later, he's in a cabaret show. And then a week after that, he's directing something off off Broadway. That, well, life. That's Austin Pendleton's life. Well, Austin Pendleton is in a play called The Dark Outside being done at Theater for the New City over on First Avenue. Again, speaking of off-off-Broadway, Austin Pendleton. So our big shout-out to him. Want to let you also know that uh, Sidney Meyer, who does all the booking for Don't Tell Mama, this is kind of the cool thing that he does, rather than uh, the hubris of saying, well, you know, I booked this club, I should just be performing there. He goes and he performs his comedy and songs at Pangea a whole different club that's over on 2nd Avenue and 11th Street. And he does that once a week on Monday nights, now through the end of November. In fact, I think he was doing it in October, and they've extended. So yay for Sidney Meyer. Want to let you know that Eric Comstock and Barbara Fasano, as you all know by now, um, on Saturday nights, they are live doing their music at Birdland Saturday night. You know, see them tonight? See them every Saturday night at Birdland through the end of November, at least. I'm, I'm sure they're going into the holidays. Gabriel Barry, our director friend, he is directing Turtle on a Fence Post, a new play at Theater 555. That's all the way on 42nd Street by like 11th or 12th Avenue, playing now through the beginning of the year. Ray Bahur, the actor, is now a co-producer of a play called A Sherlock Carol that's being done at New World Stages, and that's playing through early Jan. Uh, let's see, what else? Playing through mid-January on Broadway. So we, we, we talked about the Roundabout Theater before. Roundabout is doing a show at the American Airlines Theater, that is their Broadway house. It's called Trouble in Mind, and keep in mind that La Chance is in it. And she, she's been a wonderful friend of the neighborhood, too. So go see her. Go see Dakin Matthews in Waitress on Broadway at the Barrymore Theater. J.O. Sanders in Girl from the North Country at the Belasco Theater. Um, Off-Broadway, this got some good reviews at the Soho Playhouse, which Darren Lee Cole runs. He co-wrote and co-directs a new immersive play called Tammany Hall that they are doing there about politics and, you know, the 20s and 30s era of New York. I think that's when Tammany was. Anyway, go see it. It's playing now for an open run at the Soho Playhouse on Van Damme Street. Jim Caruso's cast party every Monday night at um, Birdland. Go to birdlandjazz.com for their website. Stagebuddy.com for my great, wonderful friend Evan Seplo. He founded Stagebuddy.com as a way for people to find out when and where theater and nightclubs and comedy and stuff to do in New York is playing. Now that people are doing stuff in New York, you've got to check out Stagebuddy.com. Dr. Demento still doing Dr. Demento shows at um, his website, Dr. Demento, D-R Demento. Dot com. Bob Cudmore, podcasting about upstate New York history at bobcudmore.com. 
BroadwayBroadway.com. SoundsOfBroadway.com is a website that Stuart Brown founded to play theater music 24-7. SoundsOfBroadway.com. And by the way, Off-Broadway, the first show that reopened after the pandemic, and the show that has been running since the 1980s, more than 13,000 performances, is Perfect Crime, which has featured since the very beginning Catherine Russell, who I, I think she owns one of the theaters in that building now. Um, and so, my God, it's been like, uh, apart from a year off for the pandemic, it should be of 33, 34 years that that show has been running in New York. Perfect crime. And so, we will have a little bit of a perfect segue for Greeley Crimes and Old Times, but those, my friends, are the friends of the neighborhood. <clears throat> Yes, indeed. So from the sublime, from Haydn music there, and if you, you want to look for Haydn's music, then you have to play Haydn and go seek. Um, I, I delivered that really badly, didn't I? But there you go. Anywho, we're going to have a bit more of the show to do, even though we have to end it early. As I promised, we're going to have <clears throat> Rabbi Saul Solomon uh, recorded at my cousin Logan's bat mitzvah. We will all, <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, we did that. And we will also have our Colorado Limerick of the Dam, where we're going to Sterling, Colorado, for a short poem. I've been writing for a couple of years now a poem about every place that I could find in the wonderful state of Colorado. And this week we've landed on Sterling, Colorado. We'll have that poem in a little bit. Plus, Greeley Crimes and Old Times. We'll do a couple of those just, uh, just to keep our hand in in terms of, you know, as we were talking to um, Alexis Green, brain fart, Alexis Green about true crime and, and crime, well, there, there's some, some crimes going on in northern Colorado. We'll let you know about them. But before then, um, some of the things I do on this program are a crime or should be. One of them is called My Sick Mind. This is where old Dave can't help himself. This is why this is why Dave does this show on Facebook Saturday mornings and uh, not on <laughs> KMAT in Los Angeles or, or you know, some major 50,000 waters somewhere because I can't stop myself from doing things like this. It's jokes that I cannot control because they come out of the brain. They have to. They are a response to the insanity of the world at large. So I apologize about them beforehand. Not only if you don't find them funny, but if you go, oh, you know, too soon, how dare he dares, I dare. Whether it's Brian Laundry, whether it's the death of Charlie Watts, I gotta, I gotta. There's my apology. So my sick mind this week is, here we go, oh. we're blasting off into Astro World. Ladies and gentlemen, you've all heard about this by now. But it shows you how out of the loop I've been. At least I'd heard of Dua Lipa. I've never heard of any kind of music by her. I think it's a her. Uh, and, and I just don't follow any of it. So when I heard that there was a terrible calamity at a concert being given by Travis Scott, I heard the name Travis Scott, and I thought some some country musician. They must say like a Grand old Opry uh, problem. And then I saw, no, Travis Scott is not. He's, he's a young, very um, cut, black fellow, good-looking, uh, a rapper. Never a man has sold millions. I'm like completely off my radar until this. He was holding uh, a concert at Astroworld, or you know, Astroworld was the name of his 2018 album. Uh, he's been doing a concert tour called Astroworld, had 50,000 people coming to see him to celebrate, you know, going to concerts after the pandemic, see this big star, Travis Scott, and, you know, he, he works the crowd up, and they want to get closer and closer and closer to the stage, and we all know what happened. The ninth crushed person died uh, yesterday or two days ago. So nine casualties, and, and of course, the finger pointing everywhere. It's like, you know, 
people say, how could Travis Scott continue with a concert when he saw ambulances trying to get through the, how can he know and how can he not see? And Travis Scott said, I didn't know. He went to party at Dave and Buster's after the concert. Because well, people, people, people fainted. That happens at concerts all the time. You know, nothing to him. So he's pointing the finger. Live Nation is, is you know, being mum, but people are pointing it at them. Like, how do you hold concerts after so many concerts over the years have things like this happen right is i mean who remember the who concert 50 years ago with kids getting crushed if you read the, the keith richards rolling stone book uh life that he wrote one of the things that nobody talks about is there's a chapter in there about what the craziness in 1964 and five uh, and, and people were falling and dive bombing and, and there were casualties at Rolling Stones concerts when the girls were getting so incredibly hopped up and crazy. So this is not new. And crowd control is not, I, I guess, I guess concerning January 6th, crowd control is still something we haven't managed to master. We can put William Shatner on the actual fucking space, right? Well, not the moon yet, but we can get him into outer space, but we can't do crowd control like a concert. Um, and like a fifty thousand people concert for sure, and and but you know then people are blaming Travis Scott again because he has a history of telling people at like Lollapalooza go storm the barricades. You know, come on, everybody, if you don't have a ticket. Well, they did that at Woodstock. You know, and there were one or two people died at Woodstock. A couple of people gave birth. It was a mellow thing. And yeah, after a certain point, there were so many people said, "Come on in." Woodstock, it worked out fine. Travis Scott, not so much. So anyway. Everybody's pointing and everybody's saying, this is this person's fault and that person's fault, like the armorer in the uh, Alec Baldwin thing. Be that as it may, we now know what happened at the Travis Scott concert, the, the Astroworld thing. And Dave is contributing to the noise surrounding all of this by writing jokes about tasteless jokes. If you don't like them, leave the room for a minute. That's all they take. There's 10 of them. Here are the 10... Travis Scott jokes of my sick mind. My sick, my sick, my sick, my sick, my sick, my sick mind. Well, talk about bad taste. My sick, my sick, my sick, my sick, my sick mind. You sick little monkey. And I should mention that it, it helps if you know Travis Scott's music and album titles, because most of these are taken from those. That, that kind of makes it a little funnier, I hope. What were the kids saying at the Astro World concert? Look, Mom, I can't fly. Wait, I need, I need, uh, I need music for these. <laughs> Just so that it doesn't die such a horrible death. Here we go. What do Travis Scott concert goers resemble? Birds in a trap. What state? What state were Astro World concert goers left in? Sicko mode. See, there, nobody who watches this show listens to any Travis Scott. But if there's, you know, a kid who knows Travis Scott would go like, "Oh, that's a title. I get it." Um, what couldn't concert doers do? Uh, con concert go What couldn't concert goers do? Wake up. What did they turn into? Skeletons. <laughs> Could electronic equipment have stopped the tragedy? Yes, they needed more surge protectors. <laughs> What's the best place to stand at a Travis Scott concert? Way back. <laughs> is every Travis con uh, is every Travis Scott concert a success? No, but he's had many smashes. <laughs> And finally, not a moment too soon, were fans disappointed when he cut the concert short? Disappointed? They were crushed. <laughs> and that, my friends, dear God, is my sick mind. All right, ladies and gentlemen, 
we have a bit more of show to do for you. Because even though I'm leaving early, you know, we're going to be here until probably a quarter to 11 with more of the 824th edition of Dave's Gone By. Remember that you can watch all these older shows and listen to the really early ones. The first, uh, the really early ones are like 10 to 15 years of the program. When it was either on terrestrial radio or an audio podcast, it wasn't until about mm, 2018, I think, that we started doing these live on Facebook with video and making them not really television, but at least you know, TV on the radio or, or radio on the TV, really. So speaking of which, go to davesgoneby.com. That is my website, D-A-V-E-S-G-O-N-E-B-Y, davesgoneby.com, because Every show that we've managed to save since we started, and that I would really say is about 99% of our programs. Some of them had technical difficulties. There's a couple that are not in the best audio shape. But really, for the most part, there are years and thousands, literally thousands of hours of Dave's Gone By entertainment, Davertainment, if you will. That's there for the plucking absolutely free. You can download it as an MP3, or you can just kind of stream it. If you don't want to download something on your computer, just click play and stream every show virtually that we have ever done. From the hour-long programs that we started doing in October of 2002, when we were on Long Island Radio, to the, the long shows with tons of music that we had when we were at UNC Radio, when we were doing college radio, to to these programs that are usually three to four hours long, all of them searchable, easy to find, like a guest that you might be interested in, and everything's archived and carefully put together. There's even a separate archive on davesgoneby.com of just the interviews. So we snip the interview out of the program, and you say, oh, I don't want to listen to a whole three, four hour show, but I'm really interested in hearing the interview with so-and-so well, all those so-and-sos are in a separate archive on davesgoneby.com. I want to remind you that our archives are also at archive.org. So every show we've ever done is also at this nonprofit website, archive.org, the Dave's Gone By channel. Our audio archives are at castbox.fm as well. So if you're really a, um, a person who wants ease in terms of just listening, of the audio only, of being able to do a podcast. This is a podcast channel, castbox.fm. So every show we've done, if you just care about audio only, castbox.fm might be a place that you would try. We have a YouTube channel called Dave's Gone By, where we put as much stuff as we can up there too. Some of it, as we always say, got blanked out by copyright rules, especially back when we were doing recorded music and things like that. Now we don't have so much trouble. YouTube lets us do what we do. But go to the Dave's Gone By YouTube channel. And also, and I checked it out, it really was running this past Tuesday, every Tuesday night. If you are on Nassau County, Long Island, go to Cablevision Channel 20 uh, on, on, if you have Altice Cable, if anybody still has cable TV, Altice Channel 20, Tuesday nights, 9.30, Eastern Time, a one-hour excerpt from a random episode of Dave's Gone By. And it's where, you know, I look on this little Mac computer that I do the show on. I look very clear and very good. I see myself on, like, a bigger TV screen. I'm like, holy crap, I should save this in higher quality. But, uh, you know, I, I can't take up eight gigabytes and store this stuff every week. So it's not the best quality. It's not the best place to watch Dave's Gone By. That would be davesgoneby.com. But, hey, if, if you happen to be flipping through channels, and you just want a random hour-long bit of Daveness, Tuesdays, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Channel 20, on LT's Cable. And by the way, I, I didn't mention, of course, on Facebook itself, you have to be a Facebook member, but once you are, you can scroll down the Dave's Gone By page and watch the last couple of years of shows here, too. You just, just you know click them, they're right there. It takes a while to load up if you keep going and going on Facebook, but they're there. Anyway, that's all different ways just to, to watch the show, to be part of the show. If you want to get in touch with me, Dave's gone by at AOL, 
Dave.com is the way to do it. And check my Twitter feed, Radio Dave 2. And maybe I'll get a new phone for the holidays, in which case I will start doing some Instagram. And, and for no particular reason, you'll see Dave's gone by there as well. I mean, or, or information about the show. Anywho, anywho, whew. Let's go on with a bit more of the program before I've got to scoot out of here and get to Bat Mitzvah Part 2. And as we said, we'll end the show with Rabbi Saul talking to people at Bat, at Bat Mitzvah Part 1. But before then, let's get a little bit criminal with a couple of stories from Greeley Crimes. Actually, I need, I need a little bit of a better uh, noisemaker for this. How do get a couple of the usuals? This will help. <coughs> We call it Greeley Crimes and Old Times. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Greeley Crimes. So what this is, I haven't explained it this week, is um, items that were in the Greeley Tribune newspaper. That is an actual real newspaper that has been around for well over 100 years in northern Colorado. One column every week takes the weirdest, funniest, bizarrest phone calls, I know that's not a word, that come into the Greeley police dispatch from people who are like, oh my God, this is happening in my town. The funniest ones, it's public record. So they put them in a column in the paper that's really fun to read. Also, our friend there, Mike Peters, goes into the newspapers from 100 years ago, from 1921, and finds items that were in the actual newspaper that are kind of nostalgic or goofy or funny, and we share those two. We mix them up and we call it Greeley Crimes and Old Times. Our first crime! Oh no! Let's see. Joyce usually does this, but she's at a conference, so let's... Well, that's certainly not the noise I need. How about, um, do I have a siren? Well, I guess that'll do. <laughs> a caller. Oh, here's a caller. A caller on 8th Street reported a man, thank you, sleeping in a boat that wasn't his in the hotel parking lot. How, I mean, how is there a boat in a hotel parking lot? I mean, I know Greeley sometimes has heavy rain, but seriously... A man sleeping on a boat that wasn't his in the parking lot of a hotel. A woman, by the way, on 8th Avenue. A lot of things happen on 8th. Thank you. The woman said she left her phone at the McDonald's drinking fountain and someone stole it. The thing that um, surprises me here is McDonald's has a water fountain? Um, and I wonder... If they do, has McDonald's found a way to put empty calories in the water? That's that's the real question there about that one. <laughs> Thank you. A caller. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I'm on the air. Yeah, mm -hmm. Okay, got it. I'll let, I'll let them know. A caller on 24th Street reported a strange interaction between him and a solicitor who tried to get him to sign stuff and gave him a spray bottle. <laughs> oh, these newfangled COVID cures. <laughs> Don't even know. Let's do some old-timey ones. Let, let's, let's get a couple that were from 100 years ago. A local painter put on a Halloween celebration last night at the Boyd Cigar Store in Greeley. He went in, bought some cigars, then started shouting and making loud noises. When they tried to escort him out, he kicked a hole in the glass door while well, he was taken to jail, and he had to return later to the shop to get his teeth, which he left on the counter. But let's just, let's just, again, 100 years ago, this happened. This was in the paper. A painter somehow got high on cigars. I don't know what he was rolling into them. Uh, when, they, when he started being obstreperous, they tried to escort him out. He kicked a hole through a glass door. They brought him to jail. And then when he got out of jail, or, or maybe the same night before he went back into jail, they had to bring him back to the place he destroyed to get his teeth. In a night of Halloween fun, 
at the teacher's college, um, which is what I think UNC <clears throat> turned into in Greeley, the student had a dunking contest. The students did there, dunking their heads in bathtubs full of water and taking out the apples with their teeth. They also had a campus horror tour uh, where they found decapitated people and the bones of departed professors. Pause. All fake, of course. <laughs> oh, oh, old time humorless. What is that even supposed to be? Oh, I think it's a farm. I'm not sure. Local farmer Fred Steele was caught speeding and had to pay $14 in fines. People said he was going 25 miles per hour in his auto. Whoa. Oh, I keep hitting that one. Nah, I need to find, I need to, something else. Let's try this one. Let's not try that one. Let's go elsewhere also, because one thing that we do every week on um, in Grilly Crimes and Old Times on Dave's Gone By is find an item from another place. So all of these are from northern Colorado, except for one story or two, we go elsewhere in the world for some odd weird news fun news this one comes from london it was reported by reuters it was a story that went everywhere okay so back in 2019 british prime minister and his wife carrie simmons adopted a rescued jack russell cross puppy named dylan they happen to spell it d-i-l-y-n because that's how the british do okay fine however on tuesday Prime Minister Johnson said that Dylan had, quote, romantic urges and was, quote, endlessly at people's legs in Downing Street. Johnson then asked a police dog handler who had an Alsatian, do you have to worry about his romantic urges? The handler replied, oh, no, not so much, no. And Interior Minister Pretty Patel, and she was a pretty Patel, chuckled. So nice to know that if you're ever invited, to do tea with the Prime Minister of England in number 10 Downing Street, uh, and the dog is loose, the dog is going to find your leg really, really friendly and interesting. How far we come with, like, leaders and heads of state, right? I mean, you think of, like, Queen Elizabeth and Victoria and these old queens, and, and, and Americans too, Abraham Lincoln. Right? And then these are George Washington, these professorial ideas that were never really true in the first place. But even so, like Reagan still, right? Reagan had, uh, he was an actor. He, he acted with a monkey. And yet as president, he still had the Reagan. And then Trump came along. It was like, <laughs> you know what was going to come out of his mouth. And then Carter was all you folksy with the teeth. And now Biden's like, what, what happened? Where, where did leaderly leaders go? Well, we had William Obama. We did. We did. But the, the, the leaderly leader. And will someone do something about Boris Johnson's haircut? Sti I, you know, at some point, I like the guy. But good Lord. Let's get back to some crimes on grilly crimes in old times. A caller on Wedgwood Drive reported Hispanic workers with permits were being harassed with racial slurs by the Homeowners Association president. Well, does that tell you everything you want to know about how more things change, more things remain the same? Not, not just some asshole, not just some drunken guy, but the Homeowners Association president. God, a caller near 15th Avenue and Glenmere Boulevard reported high school boys were fighting and carrying bats. Bats? I mean, uh, I hope they weren't biting the bats because, you know, that's how COVID started. Charge. One or two more, and then we'll, we'll get on with the rest of the program. A caller on First Street said a woman in pajama pants was jumping in and out of traffic. Well, you know, if you're going to jump in and out of traffic, you're going to want to be noticed. Right? You're not going to want to wear all black. You're not going to want to blend into the background. So every pajama they seem to make is all plaid. I think she was wise. I think if you're going to do running, leaping in and out of four lanes of traffic, you're going to want to wear pajamas. I, I say 
props to her. And speaking of props, finally, a caller on 14th Street, uh, sorry, 14th Avenue, this is important, the 14th Avenue, found a set of teeth buried in the ground. Maybe they were te the teeth that belonged to that other guy who had to run and get them back from the jail. Um, the caller found a set of teeth buried in the ground. It was later discovered that the teeth were a Halloween prop. <sighs> and those, my friends, are grilly crimes and old times. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Mr. Horace Greeley was no fool. I'm sure that you'll agree with me that Greeley was no fool. But he is getting a new set. Mr. Greeley was no fool. Yippee-yay, 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 yay, yay, yippee 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 Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is 10.30 even. Uh, right here on Dave's Gone By with me, Dave Lefkowitz. It's our 824th episode of the program. We've been calling it Green Day in honor of our new friend of the neighborhood, author Emily Mann. Remember to get... Oh, oh no! Woo! Man, man, that bop uh, just just wrecked me. I'm so sorry. Written by M Alexis Green. Excuse me, about Emily Mann. It's called Emily Mann rebel artist of the american theater it's available all the places you get books um and, and it's a the imprint by the way is applause theater and cinema books do check it out i started reading it it's a really interesting story um alexis green so great to have her on the program are we done with this episode of the show that we will be ending early that's why i apologize to all of you who um who tune in most specifically for our weekly quiz or, or today yesterday trivia quiz we're giving that a rest for a week i just don't you know I'm, i've got to get out of here i'm going to be over in oceanside at noon uh to see more family mm. uh, so so yeah we had to put that aside that's all right i could i needed a break writing all those questions is uh you know it takes up a lot of time and energy it's nice to have a week off from that but i did not take a week off and perhaps i should have from writing a brand new Colorado limerick of the damned. Now, my wife Joyce and I lived in Colorado for a bunch of years, and, uh, you know, I really love the state, and I, I like living in northern Colorado, but something that occurred to me for no particular reason, and certainly no good reason, was to write a poem about as many places in Colorado as I could think of or find on a map or on a list, from Big, big cities to towns to little Hickbergs. And, and um, I used to date a girl named Hickberg. She was very nice. But, uh, and then the family changed its name at Ellis Island from Hickbergstein. But Sterling, Colorado comes up this week. There is a Sterling, Colorado. Well, I'll tell you about it when I do, or as I do, our weekly Colorado limerick of the damned. You're the poetry man. A limerick is a comic verse of five lines, in which lines one, two, and five will end with words that rhyme. And likewise, verses three and four also end with words that rhyme. So, this is a limerick. Colorado Rado, indeed. Sterling, Colorado, today for our limerick. Let me tell you about Sterling. It is a home rule municipality on the eastern plains in far northeastern Colorado, and it's a big place. It's got like a population of about 15,000 people. If you've heard of other places named Sterling, there's a reason for that. Sterling, Colorado was actually named for Sterling, Illinois, which is where a railroad official lived, and one of those people, I guess, pioneered the town. Sterling, Colorado now has a junior college and a prison, plus the Logan County Courthouse, which is the um, the town's really most famous landmark because it's got a, a really cool dome on it, a very pretty building. It has two radio stations and a TV station. It's got the Overland Trail Museum. Local painter and high school art teacher Eugene Carrara has 10 of his works that are on display in the courthouse. And uh, Latvian-born painter William Sanderson also has his works in a gallery all in Sterling, Colorado. Sounds like a really cool place. Well, except for this particular moment when I've written a horrible, terrible poem 
about Sterling, as I do every week about a place in Colorado. So, hi the children, it is time for our Colorado Limerick of the Damned. Wait, let me, let me also get um, some kind of noise ready for this. I'm not sure what. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll try this. Okay, okay. Colorado Limerick of the Damned, Sterling, Colorado. A talented athlete from Sterling was hoping to meddle in curling, but in his big hour, his stomach went sour, and off he went, shitting and hurling. That's better. Please send your comments and complaints to Dave's Gone By at AOL.com. Dave's Gone By, D A V E S G O N E B Y, at AOL.com. Or you can certainly leave your comments if you're listening live on Facebook and, or anytime on Facebook and post your comments or direct message me there. And by the way, do also check out DaveLefkowitz.org. Dave or David Lef I've got both domains. Dave Lefkowitz. L-E-F-K-O-W-I-T-Z dot O-R-G. If you want to read um, stuff that I've written, you know, I, I keep pointing you to all the radio shows and all the audio and video, but, you know, just like Alexis Green, I was a theater critic, or, well, still am, uh, but was writing constantly for about 25 years. Those things are printed in things that are long, sort of gone, except, of course, I kept all the tear sheets. Now we're putting them up on the web. So if you're, you're interested in plays and musicals that were on or off or off off Broadway in the late 1980s all through like the 90s and interviews that I did and profiles that I did they're all there at davelefkowitz.org I mean I'm, I'm adding more and more plus my song lyrics from serious and comical songs that I've written my plays full length and one act just check it out davelefkowitz.org there's there's more than a thousand pieces of readable material from full-length plays, as I said, to, to short little bits, are all of our Colorado limericks. If you look for limericks right there, you'll see that we have about 170 or more Colorado limericks of the damned. You can read them all right there at davelefkowitz.org. It's kind of a glut. It's a lot to read at one time, but, but well worth it. Anyway, so we've done so much today. We, we've had Alexis Green on the show. Uh, we've done the Colorado Limerick. We've done My Sick Mind about Travis Scott. We did Really Crimes and Old Times. I, I talked a bit about, uh, well, I talked a bit about the Bat Mitzvah. So let us, let us get to that. Um, last night, as I mentioned, my wonderful cousin Logan Shefflin, daughter of um, Adam Shefflin and Stephanie Pinkow Shefflin, had her bat mitzvah at a local firehouse. And then the party is at a temple today. I'm, I'm not getting into that again. Anywho, mazel tov to her. She did great. I went, and my plus one, well, I, I, I took plus two. I took mom, and then I also took Rabbi Saul Solomon. Just He wasn't the rabbi who was officiating. They had a different rabbi there. But the rabbi was kind of insinuating himself into the event, into the party and talking to people and interviewing them um, for posterity, to talk to members of the family and friends and hangers on. A lot of it is people saying really nice stuff about Logan and, and the family, but then, and, and, and giving information of saying names and who they are and how they're related, which is more important to me, I'm sure, than it is to you. But every once in a while, the rabbi gets off a good one, <laughs> as, as the rabbi's wife will tell you. So let me share my screen. and. Um, Let's see how I do this. Uh, let's have a little bit of trouble, but I, I think I can manage this. I will share the screen so that I can play. It's audio only. So the rabbi walked around with one of these old-fashioned little micro recorders. <laughs> this way you can say micro recorder is old-fashioned. But here, let me... Where's my this? And can I... No, that's not there. How do I share a... a or maybe I don't need to share a screen. Actually, it's audio only. I'm not going to share. I'm just going to play it. Okay. <laughs> That's true. Um, I just have to find it now. Da, 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 da. We'll get there. Here it is. So this is Logan Shefflin's Bat Mitzvah. The, the literally happened. I'm not, again, we're not playing the ceremony 
which was very nice or any of that, just playing Rabbi Saul, Saul Solomon, founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York, um, walking around and talking to people and interviewing them briefly last night, literally, you know, it was November 12th, 2021, at Logan Sheflin's Bat Mitzvah. Do enjoy if you can. This is Rabbi Saul Solomon reporting to you from the Bat Mitzvah of Logan Shefflin in the beautiful firehouse of Woodmere, New York. I'm standing here with David Lefkowitz's aunt. Her name is Esther. She's been on the program before. We want to say shalom, Esther. How are you? I am fine. Thank you for asking. Uh, I don't really care, but, you know, it, it takes up radio time. So, so let me, it's been a, a tough road for you. You've got new hips. How are you feeling? With my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> she's got a cane and she's whacking with me with it. Do you have any nice words for Logan? For for Logan, who's bought me? Oh, she's got me go away. Look at oh, here's the papa. Hello, shalom, shalom. Do I know you? I am Rabbi Saul Solomon. Ben Lachayim. That's bad. Yeah, yeah. That's what he knows. You know, I'm grateful. Excuse me. One of my friends looked up um, my name, and the only thing that comes up on my name is the New Year's Eve interview. We did. I swear I'm not making that up. That's, that's right. That's shows up. If you look at my name, that's my claim to fame. Nothing else comes up on the internet sure. <laughs> except my show with you. Now you'll be on again because you'll be listed on the program uh, next week when we all cut right. this all into a thing. But say something nice to your dog today. Congratulations. We're so proud of you. All of us. Everyone. All of us. There you go. <laughs> Had to say all of us twice just to make sure. Hello, Grandma Bunny. Hello. But Grandma Buy Me Pink Cow, say something nice about your granddaughter there, who's bought mitzvah in today. My granddaughter is wonderful, beautiful, and she deserves everything. This is really nice. This is a, so I'm also going to talk to Dave's cousin. Shalom. Hello. This is this. She's been on the program before with her husband. So this is Deborah O'Brien with her husband, Bobby O'Brien, or maybe Bobby's the wife and she's the husband. These days you can never tell with people. The Changatels are detachable. So how are you guys doing? We're good. We're proud of Logan. We're very okay. proud of Logan. We wish her the best. For turning, is it 13 or 16 that they do? I don't even know these things. She's 13. Like the bot is the same as the bar. So how are you? How was, I mean, you had a shit year, if you don't mind my saying it's, so. It's been a shit year. It's been a shit year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been, just you been hard. That's your, your father died in a terrible thing. And then also other, but, but how about the second half of the year? It's going. <laughs> it's going. And what about you, Rob? Oh, she's trying to take, hold on, she's taking pictures. Well, I'll get out of there. Wait, now she's not taking pictures. Now I'll do this. Hello, Robert O'Brien. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. How has your year been recently? Oh, it's been very well. Oh, thank this you. This is good. What are you doing these? You have like eight jobs. What's what's two of them? Uh, I volunteer for fire department. Yeah. And I work for the Village of Valley Stream. Oh, Mid Miles on the oh, Village of Valley Stream. I work for and Valley Stream, too. See? Yeah, this there is exciting. <laughs> we have something in common. This All right. Me. Now, over there is your child, one of your child friends. Yes. Hello, child. Now tell everybody what your name is. Joseph Byrne. Wait, what the? Joseph. 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 We're all wearing masks. He's the only one nobody can understand. All right. <laughs> jo Joseph, what grade are you in there? Uh, tenth. Tenth grade. Mm -hmm. Very good. What's your favorite subject in the school? Ah, uh, psychology. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> grandma. <laughs> literally, literally, his grandmother just said sex. Yeah. This is. But in terms of things that, uh, beyond sex education, what okay. would be a, a... Lunch. Lunch, <laughs> lunch is good. I learn not to eat. I learn not to eat. Sorry. There you go. Hey, it's good to see you. And mazel tov, mazel tov, everybody. Let's see who else is here. Shalom. Shalom. We're walking around. We're getting people on the, the thing here. Who else? Who else? I don't know who that is. I don't know who hell half these people are. Maybe I'll interview the bartender. Maybe not. Oh, Shalom, Shalom, Marnie, Marnie Pinkow, who is, who is related to the, the wife of the thing, I can't even say, but how are you? Oh, good, how are you? Listen, do you have any nice Hi, words? To, oh, there's a child. Whose child is this? What child is her name? Avery. Avery, Avery. this is right. Avery. How old my is, daughter. And she is how old? Six and a half. Mid Avery, Mid Avery, stop. Avery, don't take money from mommy's purse. That's my job. So, have you had a good year? How has your year been? 
so far okay. A little what, crazy. What's, what's been the best part of your year? Having my kids in school full time. Uh, shalom again. This is Rabbi Sal Solomon at the Bat Mitzvah of Logan Sheffling. I'm here with the mama. Shalom, mama. This is. This is uh, how are you feeling? Are you nervous or are you? You know they got a cold. She'll, she'll do I'm not nervous. I don't have anything to do. Yes, that's true. Well, what about you? We have the door. We have Logan with us. Logan eyeing even this nervously. So, but but what what do you have to do today? We haven't done it yet. What are you going to be doing up there? A tap dance? Uh, no. no. Saying prayers. Right. Juggling anything? Yeah. No. Fire walking? We, we, left, we left her fire uh, juggling things at home. We left them at home. We're at a firehouse. You couldn't use them. She does this once in a lifetime, and you left the fire know, balloons at I home. Know. This is it. So, so tell me, how is the experience of uh, studying for this and working? Have you enjoyed it? Or have yeah. you? Yeah. What has been the nicest thing about it? Um, learning about her religion. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mama, for answering for yeah, the dog. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. good. Why don't you go up there exactly. and do a service? No, thank you. She should. <laughs> what, what grade are you in, by the way? Hey. Hey. So what is your favorite subject in school? Algebra. Mit mazel. That means congratulations in my language. <laughs> I think you'll be fantastic. It's a wonderful thing. And, and it's, let's also talk to your, your brothers okay. here. You've got two of them. So they're, they're, oh, I don't remember the names. I can't get Connor them. Connor and Dylan. Connor and Dylan. So Connor, actually... Mommy, you will tell us here. Now, Lo the L, Logan, named for your dad. The L is for your father, no? Yes. So, the L, her first name, Logan, is for my dad, Les. Then, her middle name is Emily, for her papa, Eric. Okay. And our last name is Shefflin, so her initials actually spell out Les. Oh, that's nice. Yes. Lester, your father. Lester, Les, right? Yes. And so, and, and Connor and Dylan, how do they come so about? So, Dylan, D for Dylan is after Adam's grandpa, Dave, who okay. he was very close to. Dylan and Brady is for my grandparents, Beatrice and Bernard. Right. And then Connor is named for my mother-in-law's mother, Connie. Conchetta. I'm already so lost. This is a, but it's important. This is and what about the middle yes. name? And the Lucas is for Grandma Lucy. Lucas, oh, and, and also there's a Luke now in and the now family. Have a Luke. brother just yes. had a child that he named Luke for the Baby first Luke. Yep. Baby Luke. This is so good. Yes. So do you remember your bat mitzvah? Bat mitzvah? No. Yeah, not a moment of it. No. Not, I remember pictures, but I don't remember any of it. Oh, wait, I think there's uh, somebody's no, hitting the not, microphone yeah. insistently. Yeah, this usually sorry, means yeah. something. Anyway. Um, oh, I don't yeah. remember. Do you wish you there or uh, doesn't yes. matter? Yes. Yeah. I don't remember last week. <laughs> it's weird. The pandemic does that. What can I tell you? you. Mazel talk to you. Mazel, thank mazel, you. Stephanie Shefflin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and many, thank you for being here. Well, not that many. You're not going to have that many more kids. But, but many, you know, a couple more of these things, and then you'll be done. Thank okay, you. Go say hi to people. Shalom, shalom, hello. I'm, I'm doing some taping here for the family. My name is Sal Solomon. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask, oh, you, 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 you'll be right back, whoever you are. Who are you? Hello. Gil Christ. Gil Christ. 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 Like, okay, so how do you know the family here? Because uh, you, I don't know. I was um, Adam's coach, and I worked with Adam and Stephanie. Oh, my God. Coach like on, on baseball? I coached him in soccer. Oh man, this is marvelous. So yeah. thank you. It's wonderful that you're coming. Thank and you. and so you've known them since they were like No, since he was in high school. Oh. Oh. Well thank you for coming anyway. <laughs> it's, it's a delight to meet you. The pleasure. It's Here is the you. mother of <laughs> David Lefkowitz, who hosts the Dave's Gone By program, saying a little something for Logan on her bat mitzvah. Go! Logan. Why don't you say that again? It's quite low. They're doing it loud. Mazel tov. Logan, I'm wearing my mask, so you can't hear me anyway. Well done. That, that was just charming. All right. We're going to talk to more people as we get a chance. Oh, shalom. We are here at the Bat Mitzvah of Logan, and I'm here with the brother of the woman who pushed Logan out of her birth canal. This is Joshua Pinkow, new daddy. He was just new on the daddy. program a week or so ago. How, how are you doing? Are you getting any sleep at all? A little bit, a little bit. When we can, in chunks. Now, how is Luke Foster Pinkow doing since we saw him on the air? He's doing good. He's doing good. He's getting by. Sleeping a little bit more, but, you know. Do you have any memories of your bar mitzvah? 
I was saying to Dana in the car right over here that it's weird that I do have such vivid memories of my bar mitzvah and I'm going into Logan's now. It's kind of strange. A little surreal. Well, well, what do you remember? What's a, a very particular memory? I remember going to the uh, cantor lessons and learning the Haftorah and actually going through that. I remember being nervous to get up on the bima. And then I remember the party. That's what you're, you know, a kid, when you're a kid. That's what you're here for. This is true. Did, did you have a memory glass? We used to make those. We used to, have to melt wax think, in a glass. I think friends might have made that, but I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, let's also talk to the mama for a moment. If, if she's even awake. Hello. Shalom. Shalom. Mazel tov to you. I love that. What's wrong with him? How many times have I heard that question? So, Shalom, this is Rabbi Sal, in case you don't know who I am after all these goddamn years. You have a little, little baby. I do. What about being a new mama? Did you expect and what didn't you expect? Oh my God, it's so hard. <laughs> yes, it is. I expected never to sleep ever again, which is true. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, maybe I didn't expect, I didn't have motherly instincts, so I didn't know that I would be able to, to do it. <laughs> but you're doing it. Somehow it's happening, yeah. So Luke is fine. He's, he's flourishing, as they he's a, say. Yep, he's doing good. He's, you know, we're feeding him. <laughs> well, we bathed him today, so it's a big deal. This is good. Um, this is good. By the way, your name is Dana. Dana. <laughs> we haven't really... Your Dana Pink Cow formerly was Mazara, was it? Yep, yep, yep. Just, just getting all these details down. Yeah. And, and yeah, so, so... And Josh is teaching me, so we're pretty good. No, we're getting that. Have you picked we'll out, um, out his career yet? Oh, God. His trajectory. If you ask Josh, it would be anything, I don't know, financial or <laughs> something like that. Anything yeah. involving money. Yes. Big money would be great. Anything right. <laughs> mean, that makes you money. Yeah. Even though we're wishing, of course, today, this is Logan's night, wishing her a mazel tov. Mazel tov to you. Thank you Dana so much. having us tell them all good things. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Shalom, shalom. I'm Sal, and I'm, I'm doing some tapings here of all the people at this gathering, this this wonderful simcha, and I'm talking to, hello. Susan Stupak. Susan Stupak. And how do uh, do you know Logan and all these people? Yes, I know the whole family. My husband works at the firehouse with Adam. Oh, lovely. And yes. they're very good friends, and we got very friendly, and they're a wonderful family. Love the kids. And Logan, you look gorgeous. She does, she does. And you look pretty, you look pretty uh, nice. Yeah, what do you do? What's your day job? What do you do? What do I do? I work for CBS. Uh, you ever hear 1010 Wins, WFAN? Yes, I sell advertising. In what capacity? I sell advertising around the country. Well, it's uh, lovely to meet you. Too. And let me also... Uh, husband Adam. Hello, husband Adam. Adam Stupak, is this yes. is correct? So, Adam Stupak, shalom to you. My name is Sal. I'm doing some just uh, talking to people, seeing who's here. And what do you do? You're the firehouse guy? I'm a firehouse guy. <laughs> And I am my wife's concierge. Oh, so you squire her as needed. Anything she needs, I get her her coffee. Anything she wants, she gets. Do you remember anything about your own bar mitzvah? Yes. What? It was very nice. <laughs> I had a great time. It was upstairs in the firehouse, similar to this. Really? No, no. but it just sounds like a good story. <laughs> It was in Staten Island, because that's where I grew up. Uh, now I'm, I'm starting to get Now you the, understand. The deadpan was beautiful. On I, I wish this had a camera so they could see how well played that was. Well played, sir. Yes, thank you, thank you. So, mine was in Staten Island, because that's where I grew up, and it was very, very nice. Do you remember your Parsha, like your Haftorah, any no. part of it? Not at all? No. no. That, that was torture, so I blocked that out. <laughs> But he remembers all four kids born about mitzvahs. We yes. have four kids. Huh? Oh, Mitmas, do you remember yours? I'm you Sephardic. We didn't have one. Oh, you're from the Spanish side. Ooh. Ooh. It's okay. We like you anyway. <laughs> Not as much as before. I'm, if... I'm a real Jew. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, mit mazel on your four kids. Mit mazel on the marriage. It's so good. To Logan and yes, to the we love you, Logan. You're beautiful. You're a great family. All right, Shalom. I am here with Dave's cousin Adam Pinkow, the brother of the girl who gave the birth. The, the kids just had the marmots. How are you doing, Adam Pinkow? I'm good. The last time we did this was at my birth. This, this is true. Right? I was there when your mom pushed you out of the birth canal. I was, there, I was there too. You were eight pounds, one ounce when you were born. I mean, he actually remembers that. Of uh, the doctor and I was thinking, everybody went, whoa! Oh! Now I think crap's that big. <laughs> hey, you're, you're trying to best me at my own game here. That's very good. So, do you remember your bar mitzvah? No, but I remember my bris. Do you really? Oh, was it, did it hurt? 
I don't know. I had a couple of glasses of wine, they said. Oh, then the rabbi wasn't doing it right. No, okay. oh, should have screamed. Oh, I know I did. In fact, I do whatever I do somebody else's. So do you wish Logan any mazel, any good things in a serious kind of way? I wish her all the best in the world. We love her. Now, you have children yourself, right? You've got to... Uh, That's what I'm told. You know, well, tell us about your, your uh, little my kids. My two little ones? Yes. My five, my nine, my nine-year-old and my six-year-old? Yes. Avery and Lila? What? Now, this is this is this is Avery. Hello, Avery. Say, say hi. hi. Hello. Oh, she's just running away from me. Say Most hi. women do. Hi. How are you? How, are you in school yet, or do you do print in kindergarten? What is that for? That's a recorder. Say congratulations, Logan. This is what people used to use before Zoom. Well, how's Lila doing? What the hell? Lila's yeah. doing good. She's uh, 12 years old, and we're getting ready for her bar mitzvah. Oh, you're going to do that too? Oh, mit mazel. I better be invited, goddammit. Yeah, we'll see how funny you are. <laughs> do I get to do that to perform the ceremony? Yes, okay. and the bris. And the bris on that too. Well, that's, uh, you get someone African to do that one. We won't talk about that. But anywho, Adam, Adam Pinkow, it is a pleasure. It is a delight to have you in Dave's family and mit mazel with your family, too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Shalom, shalom. My name is Sal. I just wanted to say you did a lovely job. This is the rabbi, yes. who is the officiatrix, if you will, of, of the proceedings here. So tell us, in your opinion, how did Logan do? Logan did fabulous. She learned it. She nailed it, hit it out of the park. It was better than winning the Stanley Cup. Hang on, then wait. Wow. Oh, are you the Ranger Japan? Or who is the Ranger Japan that we're talking about? You're the Ranger Japan. I feel sorry for you, but other than what is, remind me, what is her name, please? Rabbi Cheryl Stern. Rabbi Cheryl Stern, affiliated with uh, where? What? Uh, Just Rabbi Cheryl Stern. How long have you been? 11 years. Oh, I'm at Mazel McClick. And where are you from? Are you conservative, conservative docs, reformative docs? I, um, I grew up in North Woodmere, across the street from Grandma Ginger. Oh my goodness. My but, mom and Ginger are best friends. Oh, so you're not family, but you are a friend of family. I think we are family at this point. Like, <laughs> like family, sort of, sort of ersatz family, but important thing up because you did a lovely, lovely job. Thank you. How many of these do you normally do? How many? About 50 a year. Wow, mit Muslim. Do you do funerals as well? Because I don't know how Funerals, weddings, gonna... namings, yeah. Namings? Oh, Maybe namings, right. no brisses. I don't snip. <laughs> I don't snip. I now, do. is this your, your lovely this husband? Or? Adam. Adam, and again, the last name, I Stern. Adam Stern. So, so how did you meet this lovely rabbi here? Go ahead. J-Date. <laughs> oh, with J-Date, with Mazel. Oh. So, and what do you do? I'm in uh, property management. Oh, yes, this is a good time to be uh, in real estate, I have Absolutely. to say. So, tell me something. Are you, are you, do you, are you proud every time you come to one of these and see your wife in action? Every yeah. single time. You should go ask my mother, because this was her first time seeing me in action, how she really? feels. First time ever? Oh. I'm going to talk to the mother here of the rabbi. Hold on. Hold on. Shalom. Shalom. And your name is? Verna Green. Hello, Verna Green. And nice this is my you. husband, Dr. Harvey Green. Dr. Harvey Good Green. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Can you look at a cyst that I have on my... No, I'm kidding. Just... So, Verna, you, you are... Verna, the... Verna, Verna with an sorry. M. Verna with an M. So, are you proud of your daughter oh, watching yes. her up there? Very proud of her. So, what did you think? Did, you couldn't have imagined when you were young that your daughter would grow up to be a rabbi. What did you think she would end up being? She wanted to be a teacher. Oh, that makes sense. And uh, this came along at the right time. So, she went online from New York State and became a rabbi. She's known as Rabbi Cheryl Stern. That's right. And I'm very proud of her. As well you should be. Now, what do you do, sir? I'm a retired physician. Oh, you, that's right. You are a doctor, but no longer a doctor, which is why you can't look at my neck. All right. right. This, is, this is good. And what were you? Are you still? What do you do? This is the white here. I spent his money. <laughs> On that note, I thank you. I can't print it fast enough. There you go. Well, it is a pleasture to meet both of you. And Mazel Tov. Thank you. And then on these happy, more happy occasions. Thank you. Come on. Hello, Shalom. I know you're eating, but I want to say hello. My name is Sal. You are the grandma. You are Grandma Ginger, they call you, because of the, well, I don't want to know if uh, the, the curtains and drapes, but what is your actual name there? Virginia. Virginia. Oh, that, make, that also makes a lot of sense. So, tell me something. Are you are you quelling? Are you, are you filled with pride and joy yes, today? Yes, I am. I think she's wonderful. She did a wonderful uh, job, and I think she's a beautiful girl inside and out. 
and I'm just so proud of her. Of course, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, what did you? What? Uh, what was your career? What? Um, I was a registered nurse. Oh, so we have a doctor in your family and a nurse. This I have so three children that are doctors. Is there anything better than a rabbi talking to a family of doctors? <laughs> I don't think so. Anyway, a pleasure to meet you and Thank Mazel you. again. Thank you. Oh, Shalom, this is Sal again. I'm saying hello to some wonderful people at this occasion. Yo, Shix is at the party, Steve. Hello, Steve. Steve what? Steve Cianciato. Good God, I'll never... Yeah. Can you write that on a Hebrew? It's a last name. It's a last name. So how do you know these, these wonderful Dana and... and oh, uh, I know Josh and Dana are friends of my sister. For Logan, Logan is a great, great person with a great soul. She's like the, uh, the, the mother of our block to all the kids on it. Uh, and we love Logan. Yes, I mean, who is this? Is this, this your is Ella. Man? This is my daughter, Ella. Your who looks up to Logan? Do, do you look up to Logan? Yeah. <laughs> Rather a leading question, I think. But okay. <laughs> now let me talk to this person. Is this your uh, your mama? Hello. Shalom. Hello. 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 I'm Jody. Jody, Steve's also wife. with that Italian last whatever that what yep. was it called. Cienciato. Cienciato. It's like scientist. What does it mean? Do you know? Uh, I do not. Okay. I do not know what it means. What does it mean? Wow. Cienciato. A lot of vowels. A lot of vowels. A lot of vowels. And what do you do? What's your What's your day job? Uh, I lead an operations group for a technology company. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was sleeping there for a minute. What are you were talking about? No, I'm kidding. Anyway, thank you so much for coming. It's a delight to see you. Oh, great to see you too. Oh, and nice word for a uh, nice word for Logan. Oh, yes. We love Logan. So congratulations to Logan. We are so excited to be here celebrating with her. And we love her. Thank you so much. This is Rabbi Saul Solomon reporting to you from the Bat Mitzvah of Logan Shefflin. Rabbi Saul doing the honors there um, with, yes, he was there live last night. That was recorded on November 12th, 2021, just literally about um, you know 15 hours ago at a firehouse in Whitmere, New York for the Bat Mitzvah Part 1 of Logan Shefflin, my cousin. And, and uh, he didn't interview me. Rabbi, of all the people on that, uh, Rabbi, you know, could have at least taken like 10 seconds and said, hey, Dave, say something nice about Logan. But uh, hey, it's his moment. It's the rabbi's call, so I will take this opportunity to say Mazel Tov, Logan. I will be seeing you in just an hour or so um, and for, for part two of your bar mitzvah, the party part in the religious temple area. Don't go there. Anywho, but really, really and, and congratulations, of course, to my Aunt Bonnie, who is the grandma, and I know her late husband Lester is looking down and, and very happy and proud too. And congratulations, of course, to my cousin Stephanie and her husband Adam and to their other kids and to the whole Pinkow Shefflin Lefkowitz clan. It's, it's, it's a nice thing. Anywho, a nice thing is doing this program, Dave's Gone By, every Saturday from 9 until noon or thereabouts. It's a little bit after 11 o'clock, so we've got to wrap up the show early this week, but not before thanking so many folks who help us do this program. Well, first of all, there is Rabbi Saul. Remember that his website is shalomdammit.com. You can watch his TV show that he did for uh, Long Island Cable TV about 10 years ago, or more than that now. Um, 10 episodes, they're hilarious. Also, I'm, I'm mentioning, I'm teasing that next week we're going to have a promo, a four-minute promotional advertisement for Shalom Dam at the Stage show. If you want to watch the whole show, the old version from 2012, and then watch the promo and see where we picked out little bits of it, just go to shalomdammit.com. Com. Shalom, D A W M I T, Shalom, damn it, dot com for all things rabbinical of Rabbi Saul. So thank him also for, for doing the honors. And also, we got to thank most of all our guest in the neighborhood today, Alexis Green, author of the new book, Emily Mann, rebel artist of the American theater. This is Emily Mann. There should be, oh, and there's a picture of Alexis, but of course, you can. You saw her before. If you missed the interview that I did with her early in the program, remember that we save all these shows at davesgoneby.com. Give us about 24 hours to get this program 
up on the website, uh, although it will be readily available on Facebook within about 10 minutes after the show's over. So you can, you can just grab it here. But anyway, thank you, thank you so much to Alexis Green, and go to alexisgreen.com. Remember, there's an E on the end of green there. So Alexis, G-R-E-E-N-E dot um, to read about her other books and her life and what she's been up to. I'm uh, just a delightful guest in the day of her. Thank her so much for joining us today. Thank you to my adorable and wonderful wife, Joyce, for her help early in the program. She's busy at a meeting that was supposed to be in Arizona <laughs> a couple of months ago. And they're like, eh, pandemic's not quite over yet, which was a big relief for her because she still wouldn't, wouldn't have gone. You know, if, 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 uh, even with the, the curve kind of going down, most places, sort of, with people who are vaccinated and she's got the booster and everything else, still, it's better. She's watching everything on the screen, taking part that way. So, uh, but I still thank her for the help that she brings to this program, only in this episode and certainly for every episode. Love you, Joyce. Um, and let's see, who else did anybody else have to thank? I don't. I think so. No, I'm, I'm going to give a shout out, of course, to David Sheward and Leslie Hoban Blake, who are our usual today, yesterday trivia contestants, our panelists. We took that week off this week, but they should be back next week in the neighborhood playing the game. So hope to see you all then as well. We're trying to line up some guests for the weeks ahead. Not going to say who they are, not going to jinx it, but not when we should have some cool people joining the neighborhood for our 825th episode here, episode of the show, um, which is next week, next Saturday, November 20th, 2021. Until then, don't miss your days going by. This is Dave Lefkowitz and Gone By. Days gone by. Days gone by.